Chapter Twelve of The Life of Benjamin Franklin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Benjamin Franklin by Samuel G. Goodrich. Chapter Twelve. Appointed Postmaster General, journey to New England, receives degrees from two colleges. Story of the visit to his mother. Having been some time employed by the Postmaster General of America in regulating the several offices and bringing the offices to account, upon his death in 1753, Franklin was appointed jointly with another gentleman to succeed him. The American office had before this time never paid anything to that of Great Britain, and the new postmasters were to have six hundred pounds between them if they could make that sum out of the profits of the office. To do this, a variety of improvements were necessary, some of which were at first very expensive, so that, for the first four years, the office became more than nine hundred pounds in debt to them. Afterwards they began to be repaid, and before Franklin was displaced, they had brought it to yield three times as much clear profit to the Crown as the Post Office of Ireland. After Franklin's dismission, they never received a farthing from it. The business of the post office occasioned his taking a journey to New England, where the College of Cambridge presented him with a degree of Master of Arts. Yale College in Connecticut had before paid him a similar compliment. Thus, without studying in any college, he came to partake of their honors. They were conferred in consideration of his discoveries and improvements in natural philosophy. It was either during this or his former journey that the story to the visit of his mother originated. He had been some years absent from his native city, and was at that period of his life when the greatest and most rapid alteration is made in the human appearance. Franklin was sensible that his person had been so much changed that his mother would not know him, unless there was some instinct to point out, at a single glance, the child to its parent. To discover the existence of this instinct by actual experiment, Franklin determined to introduce himself to his mother as a stranger and to watch narrowly for the moment in which she should discover her son. On the afternoon of a sullen cold day, in the month of January, he knocked at his mother's door, and asked to speak with Mrs. Franklin. He found the old lady knitting before the parlor fire, introduced himself by observing that he had been informed she entertained travelers, and requested a night's lodging. She eyed him with coldness, and assured him that he had been misinformed, that she did not keep a tavern, though to oblige some members of the legislature she took a number of them into her family during the session and at that time had four members of the council and six of the house of representatives who boarded with her she added that all her beds were full and went on knitting with a great deal of vehemence franklin wrapped his coat around him pretending to shiver with the cold and observing that it was very chilly weather it was of course nothing more than civil for the old lady to ask him to stop and warm himself she pointed to a chair, and he drew himself up to the fire. The entrance of her boarders prevented any further conversation. Coffee was soon served, and the stranger partook with the rest of the family. To the coffee, according to the custom of the times, succeeded a plate of apples, pipes, and a paper of tobacco. A pleasant circle of smokers was then formed about the fire. Agreeable conversation followed. Jokes were cracked stories told and franklin was so sensible and entertaining as to attract the attention of the whole company in this manner the moments passed pleasantly and swiftly along and it was eight o'clock before any of them expected it this was the hour of supper and mrs franklin was always as punctual as the clock busied with family affairs she supposed the stranger had quitted the house immediately after coffee Imagine her surprise when she saw him, with the utmost coolness and impudence, taking his seat with the family at the dinner-table. Immediately after supper she called an elderly gentleman, a member of the council with whom she was in the habit of consulting, into another room, complained of the rudeness of the stranger, told the manner of his coming into the house, observed that he appeared like a foreigner, and she thought had something about him very suspicious. The old gentleman assured her that she need not be under any alarm, that the stranger was a man of education and agreeable manners, and was probably unaware of the lateness of the hour. He added that it would be well to call him aside and repeat to him that she was unable to give him lodgings. 
She accordingly sent a maid to him, and then repeated the account of their situation, observed that it grew late, and gently hinted that he would do well to seek out other accommodations. The stranger replied that he should be very sorry to put her to any inconvenience, and would retire after smoking one more pipe with her boarders. He returned to the company, filled the pipe, and began talking as pleasantly and forcibly as ever. He recounted the hardships and praised the piety and wisdom of their ancestors. A gentleman present mentioned the subject of the day's debate in the House of Representatives. A bill had been introduced to extend the powers of the royal governor. The stranger immediately entered upon the subject, supported the rights of the colonies with many arguments and much eloquence, and showed a great familiarity with the names of influential members of the House in the time of Governor Dudley. The conversation was so animated and interesting that the clock struck eleven, unnoticed by the delighted circle. The patience of Mrs. Franklin was by this time completely exhausted. She now entered the room, and before the whole company addressed the stranger with much anger, told him plainly that she thought herself imposed upon, that she was a lone woman, but had friends who would protect her, and concluded by telling him to leave the house. Franklin made a slight apology, put on his great coat and hat, took a polite leave of the company, and approached the street door, lighted by the maid and attended by the mistress. While the company had been enjoying themselves within, a most tremendous snowstorm had filled the streets, knee-deep, and no sooner had the maid lifted the latch than a roaring wind forced open the door, put out the light, and almost filled the entry with drifted snow and hail. As soon as the candle was relighted, the stranger cast a mournful look on the lady of the mansion and said, "'My dear madam, if you turn me out of your house in this dreadful storm, I am a stranger in the town, and shall certainly perish in the streets. You look like a charitable lady.' I should not think you could refuse shelter to a dog on such a night. Don't tell me of charity, said the offended matron. Charity begins at home. It is your own fault that you stayed so long. In short, sir, I do not like your looks, or your conduct, in thus forcing yourself upon my family, and I fear you have some bad designs. The good lady had grown so angry as to raise her voice much above its ordinary pitch, and the noise drew all the company into the entry. They did not agree with Mrs. Franklin in respect to the stranger at all. He seemed to them to be a very honest, clever-looking fellow, and so far from wishing to turn him out of the house. There was not one of them, but would have been glad to have him for a fellow boarder. They thought him very sensible and pleasant, and could not account for the landlady's aversion. At length, by their united interference, the stranger was permitted to remain in the house. There was no bed, or part of a bed, unoccupied and he was obliged to sleep all night in an easy-chair before the parlour fire. Although her boarders appeared to have perfect confidence in his honesty, it was not so with Mrs. Franklin. She very carefully collected her silver spoons, pepper-box, and porringer from her closet, and, after securing the parlour door by sticking a fork over the latch, carried them to her chamber. She charged the negro man to sleep with his clothes on, to take the great cleaver to bed with him, and to wake up and seize the vagrant at the first noise he made in plundering the house. The good lady then retired to bed with her maid, whom she were compelled to sleep in the same room. After a very restless night, Mrs. Franklin rose before the sun. She called her domestics, proceeded with them in a body to unfasten the parlor door. To her great astonishment, she found her guest quietly sleeping in his chair. She now began to feel sorry for her suspicions, Waking him with a cheerful good morning, she inquired how he had rested, and invited him to partake of her breakfast, which was always served before that of the boarders. "'Pray, sir,' said the old lady, as they were sipping their chocolate at the breakfast-table, "'as you appear to be a stranger here, to what distant country do you belong?' Franklin put a little more sugar in his chocolate, and, helping himself to a slice of toast, replied that he belonged to the city of Philadelphia. At the mention of the word, the old lady for the first time exhibited emotion. Philadelphia, said she, if you live in Philadelphia, perhaps you know our Ben. Who, madam, replied Franklin, in the same cool and undisturbed manner that he had put on ever since he entered the house. Why, Ben Franklin, said the mother. My Ben, oh, he is the dearest child that ever blessed a mother. What, said the stranger, is Ben Frankler, the printer, your son? Why, he is my most intimate friend. He and I lodge in the same room. Oh, heaven forgive me, exclaimed the old lady, and I have suffered an acquaintance of my Benny to sleep on this hard chair, while I myself rested on a good bed. 
we can well imagine that the mother was very much astonished when she found that it was not an acquaintance of her son but her son himself whose countenance and person had been so much changed that she had even been on the point of turning him out of doors she was delighted to embrace him once more before she died and was quite pleased that the member of the council had found him so agreeable a fellow as to insist that he should remain all night in the house End of chapter 12